All right, yeah. All right, I got it set up. Is everyone transitioned or, or ready to go? Yeah, I guess we're ready. Yeah. All right, cool. All right, so this is the Sagnac effect, and with respect to what is uh is motion being measured against, right? So we're going to get into the full history of it. We're going to get into some um, the experiments that followed Sagnac and uh, try and figure out what, what's going on here. Okay, well, that's not right. One second. Where's the rest of my slide? Okay, one second. Hold on. Oh, good. I just got to pull up this PDF real quick. Oh. I saw that speaky little Einstein quote. Yeah, I don't know what, why Einstein's hiding. <laughs> hiding. All right, 1905. Okay. I mean, to be fair, it's like you could really just have the whole presentation be that. Yeah, dude, I know, right? I was tempted to just do <laughs> game things are playing. <laughs> dude, it was super tempting to just do like four slides. <laughs> All right, so uh, this is from Einstein's 1905 paper uh, on the electrodynamics of moving bodies. So this was following the experiments of Michelson Morley. Uh, we don't see anything. Oh, right, right, right. One second. Thank you, sir. No problem. All right, there's the new one. All right, so this is his uh, 1905 paper on the electrodynamics of moving bodies from the, uh, the mathematics and framework presented in here and the philosophy uh, put forward here is what redefined all the physics and enabled them to um, explain the Michelson Morley experiment without, without, um, without showing that proportional velocity relationship in the fringe pattern, which we'll get to uh, later on. But here we're just going to look at the basic premise of what Einstein is putting forward. Um, and, and, we're, and we'll go over the, like the importance of why he's, why he's stating this. So he says here, examples of this short together with unsuccessful attempts to discover the, the motion of the earth relative relatively to the medium to the light medium suggests that a, that the phenomenon of electrodynamics as well as mechanics possesses no properties corresponding to the ideas of absolute rest the suggest they suggest rather that as as already shown in the first order of small quantities the laws of electrodynamics and optics will be valid in all frames for which the equations for mechanics hold good we raise this to we raise this conjecture. Uh, the purport of here, hereafter will be called the principle of relativity to the status of a postulate. Uh, we, we will also introduce another postulate, which is only apparently irrecon, uh, irreconceivable, uh, irreconceivable with the with the former, namely that light is always propagated in empty space with a definite with a def, uh, definite velocity of c, which is independent of the state of motion of the emitting body. These two postulates are sufficient for attaining a simple and consistent theory of electrodynamics of moving bodies based on Maxwell's equations, I'm sorry, based on Maxwell's theory of stationary bodies. The introduction of a luminiferous ether will prove to be superfluous in so much as here, or as the view here will be developed not to require any or an absolute stationary space provided with no special properties nor assign a velocity vector to a point of which empty space and electromagnetic process takes place. So he puts, he puts his uh, first two postulates down. We've got very specific parameters and conditions here. So the whole purpose of this theory is to explain phenomenon without uh, invoking absolute space. Um, so to invoke like a hypothetical distance change to preserve distance or without assigning a velocity vector for electromagnetic propagation. So um, in regards to that, what that would be, if you were going to change the distance, if you were going to preserve a distance with absolute space, you would also have to pr um, change time. So like the time of propagation. So this would be in relation to that. So you would be preserving both points to explain a phenomenon. So Einstein's saying, hey, man, we're going to we're going to Lorentz transform our way out of this and. We don't need no absolute space, and we don't need in, we don't need to assign velocity vectors to an empty point of space in which electromagnetic propagation took place once, right? So there's our base. Well, so then, when mm, sorry, when go they go to explain something like Michelson Gale Pearson, isn't that exactly what they do? Dude, first thing they do is that, and they and then right off the back of that, they say this is in accordance with relativity theory. It's the literal opposite. So we're he, I'm glad, so glad you pointed that out because yeah, we're gonna go through all of these contradictions. So shout out, shout out to this slide. I don't know what happened here, but that was supposed to be the uh, the introduction there to the theory. So let's see. Now another important thing to note here in this uh, in the 1905 paper is how Einstein defines an inertial frame. So as we were reading earlier, 
about you know a frame in which the equations of of Maxwell's holds true and whatnot, right? So what does that mean exactly? If you're if you're accelerating, if you're moving, are you still inertial? What's what are the rules, Ein? Tell us how it works. So Einstein says, if you are in constant uniform rotation, then you are in an inertial frame. And the logic behind that is, if you take any part of that loop and you extend it to infinity, it will not deviate from, or it'll like barely deviate from a linear path. Like it'll be just as good. So the logic behind it is our is like sound as well established. It, it tracks right. So this is this is Einstein incorporating that uh, that into his into his theories to explain a uniformly rotating device, which will be which will um, become super important later on. So it is apparent that the results. So this is quoting Einstein from his paper, and I have two sources here. One's from um, uh, another translation, like earlier, uh, like from the 30s, I think, and then this one's like a more modern one. But anyway, it says here. So if we assume that the result proved for any polygonal line is also valid for a continuously curved line, we will arrive at this result. If one of two synchronous clocks at A is moved in a closed curve with constant velocity until it makes a return to A, the journey lasts T seconds, and then by the <laughs> then by the clock which has remained at the rest traveled um, on its arrival at A will will be uh, one half T times v squared over c squared second slow so that's a that's the coefficient for time dilation how much it's going to be slowed um on its return trip so uh, based on its velocity thence we can we conclude that the balance clock at the equator and he's he makes a special reference here that he's not talking about um a pendulum he's talking about a light clock so essentially an atomic clock so he wrote this before atomic clocks obviously but uh this is one to one analogous to an atomic clock uh, so a balance clock in, uh, at the equator will move more slowly by a very small amount precisely to the clock situated at one of the poles, right? So that's his, uh, so the important thing to note there is that um, when you're in uniform rotation, the, the, the equations still hold true, so it's still an inertial frame. So his theory still applies. So the rules of special relativity about the first postulates where all, all inertial frames are equally valid, Right, and the speed of light is constant. Um, or it's constant and independent of the motion of the source or observer. Right, so in an inertial frame. Right, so that's that's uh, super important here because we're going to go over multiple instances of inertial frames where the speed of light is different. So starting off here, um, we have Sagnac. In 1913, he used a uniformly rotating platform. Um, in optical media to take to photograph a, fit, a friend shift pattern. Now his prediction for that um, he mathematically derived basically that there would be an equivalence between the length that light has to travel in the air. Um, yeah, so the area of the device and the uh, the rotational speed, the angular velocity of the device, would produce a directly proportional variance in the speed of light that would result in a friend shift pattern. So if you have a if you have a um, a disc and you split a light beam and it goes counterclockwise and clockwise and it completes its circuit when it completes that circuit there should be a friend shift pattern that that is proportional to that rotation so after sagnac and we'll watch some videos on that so you guys can get some visuals on that and uh and get familiar with it but um to summarize what sagnac and he 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 measured he made those measurements he got the proportional relationship with his um with his prediction so he gives a summary here a description of what he um as what as how he's interpreting the results here. So he says optical rotation effect. Measured from the fringe spacing, the displacement z and the interference centered at i, I uh, that I observed with the preceding with the preceding method is a particular case of the optical rotation that the path that I have defined earlier. So he's uh, talking about some earlier experiments he did and how he's, how he derived the equations. And with the context of the current ideas, we shall construct a direct observation of the luminiferous ether. In a system moving as a whole relative to the ether, the propagation time between any two points of the system should change in any way similar to a stationary system subjected to an ether wind, the relative speed of which at each point of the system will be the same and directly opposite to the speed of any point in which, in which, uh, in which would contain the light waves in a manner similar to an atmospheric wind carrying sound waves. The observed the observation of the optical effect of such an ether wind relative to a quote unquote stationary 
ether will constitute proof of the ether's existence, just as the observation of a wind relative to the atmosphere on the speed of sound in a moving system will constitute everything being equal with a proof of the existence of a stationary atmosphere enveloping a moving system. So remember, he's coming at it from the heliocentric paradigm where his interpretation of, of, of that analogy is that the earth is rotating and the atmosphere is moving uniformly with it. And within that uniform motion, there's wind that's going in, you know, various directions. Right. So that's what he's saying is that um, he's equating it in that stationary regard. Now, the way that we're interpreting it is that the earth is stationary. The, the, uh, the atmospheric wind, um, the, the stationary atmosphere that's moving with the earth is just moving. Right. And like, that's uh so it's just a moving ether wind. And then, and then within that, um, motion produce, uh, whatever is moving, you know, produces its own ether vortex so that, uh, you know, light or electromagnetic propagation is proportional to their velocity within that overarching ether wind. Any questions, comments so far? Um, could you repeat what you said just like two seconds ago about instead of the heliocentric paradigm, it, we're, we're interpreting yeah. it as... Yeah, yeah. So the way I so the way I interpret it, right? Stationary Earth. Um, you know, you could look at a Gleason's map just for like a rough outline of what it would be like, and then there would be a vortex emanating from the center, and that that rotation would be would substitute for a uniformly rotating atmosphere with the with the rotating Earth, and then motion within that vortex will have its own vortex proportional to its motion. So, the only, so yeah, the only thing that changes here is that the Earth is stationary. Okay. Right. Okay, and then so now we're going to watch a single-axis gyroscope correction. So we're going to look at a at a kind of classic setup, and we're going to look at how the um, – because uh, Sagnac even proposed this, too, for measuring Earth rotation, and then they went and did it in uh, 1925 or whatever. So this is, you know, obviously ether wind rotation, but we're just going through their, going through the paradigm and the history. All right, so we'll play this. This is by, uh, what's his name? Doug. Can't think of his last name. Um, but anyway, his YouTube channel will be provided in the, in the thing, so we'll watch this now. How do I make it full screen? Is that possible? No idea. All right, well. Not let you play it when it's full screen? Plan B. Can you uh, double click it? Yeah. There we go. I have to share it anyway with audio, so I'm just going to put it on, pull up the video. Okay, we should be good. All right, I'm going to play this at 1.5 speed and maybe 2 or maybe, yeah, maybe 1.5, and then we, and we should be good. <laughs> Rest in peace. <laughs> I, I got sound. I got sound. Yep. You're good. Sagnac and Fromber are then going to describe today is the most sensitive one that they've built to date. What's different about this one as compared to the others is that we've gone to a much longer Sagnac loop. Uh, this time we've got a one kilometer single mode fiber as the loop. And uh, other parts of it are very similar to, to the previous design. Two by two coupler with 50 50 uh, light going to each side. And we've got a polarization controller um, loop uh, connected on one side of the uh, fiber optic cable. And we're also Can using turn an it up a little bit. Yeah, system. absolutely. This time we're using a uh, common mode rejection amplifier, which then. His, this is, yeah, for, for, um, quick uh, side note this is a 13 year old video. There's only audio, it's mono audio or whatever, and it's super low. So. Um, Oh yeah, I'm only hearing that. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. It <laughs> yeah it, it, Down to 1.0. What's that? Yeah. Pick the speed off 1.25. Take it down to 1.0 again. Let's hear it again, man. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Stone. Fuck. Right. <laughs> Next to the scope, and the idea is to uh, get better noise figure on the amplifier um, as compared to the previous designs that we've used. So those are the main changes uh, with this current setup. What I've got shown next is the schematic of the common mode rejection amplifier. And the strategy here is to take the uh, pin diode signal, which is uh, shown above. One is the reference from uh, the internal to the laser. And the other one is at the end of the uh, two by two coupler, which receives the signals coming back from the loop. And uh, we put each of these diodes connected to either arm of the common mode uh, inputs. 
the idea being that they will cancel out uh, some of the common mode noise between the two and also will help control for intensity drift on the laser. So uh, this amplifier gives a total amplification of between about 500 times and 1150 times depending upon the gain and it also allows us to zero um, the signal uh, by uh, uh, balancing the voltages between the two diodes. The fully assembled electro-optic interface is shown in this figure here. This is the completed Sagnac interferometer. It is on an equatorial mount so that it can be positioned in any direction horizontally or vertically with respect to the rotating earth. For our Sagnac interferometer to experience the full rotation of the earth, we have to align it so that its z-axis is parallel to the north pole. Once it's in this alignment, which is shown in the figure here, it experiences the full rotation of the earth at one revolution per day. If, however, we turn the device perpendicular to the uh, axis of the pole as shown here, it will experience no rotation at all. In this next graphic of the Earth, you can see the two orientations of the Sagnac interferometer. The one with the axis parallel to the North Pole being the one that will experience the most rotation, and the one with the axis perpendicular, the one that will experience no rotation. And we choose these two because we're going to flip between each orientation so that we can see the maximum change in fringe shift from one orientation to the other. These are just some pictures showing the Sagnac interferometer in some actual orientations. This first one is with the z-axis parallel to the North Pole, so it should show the maximum rotation. The second one is uh, showing the z-axis uh, towards the South Pole, and this should be perpendicular to the pole, so it should show minimal rotation. The next two are for our negative controls. Uh, they face with the z-axis either west or face east, and these will show partial rotations which will cancel out. So flipping from one orientation to the other should lead to a uh, zero result. So the way that we collect the data from this experiment is as follows. The interferometer sits perfectly stationary in a particular orientation, in this case first in the south orientation, and we collect a baseline signal for about 5 to 10 seconds. Then we manually flip the interferometer over to the perpendicular direction and then take another baseline reading. So we've got essentially a baseline, and then some noise from the flipping of the instrument, and then another baseline. And this is how we compare the amount of fringe shift which has occurred from one orientation to the other. We can then use the millivolt difference between each orientation and our calibration data to determine the rate of rotation the device is experiencing due to the Earth alone. The negative control progresses pretty much the same way. We start with our baseline on uh, the east-facing configuration, and this is just showing the east-facing configuration here. We then uh, flip it over to the west-facing configuration and do a second baseline for ten, 5 to 10 seconds, and we repeat this process over and over again, flipping uh, from one orientation to another, but keeping it stationary while it's doing the baseline. And uh, then we find out what the average millivolt changes from one orientation to another by doing about 20 to 50 readings. And this is just the details of our calibration. We did calibrations for the first and second experiments, the first experiment being 50 readings, the second experiment being 20 readings, and we have the experimental results shown in the uh, table on the lower half of the slide. Uh, essentially, we were expecting a difference of around 19.44 uh, millivolts in the first experiment for our full rotation, uh, and we got 21.76. And uh, for the second experiment, we were expecting about 65 millivolts, and we got 57.5. So we're pretty close to the expected values. And for negative controls, we were expecting around zero for each uh, set of readings, and we got 3.1 millivolts in the first and 2.5 millivolts in the second. So uh, I think this was uh, fairly accurate uh, for this uh, first pass experiment with this instrument. What have we demonstrated with this experiment? First we find that the speed of light is slower counterclockwise and faster clockwise around the loop, leading to our measured fringe shift, even though the interferometer is stationary from our perspective in the lab. Because we are detecting Earth's rotation, it means that the speed of light is constant in some other preferred frame, this frame being the Earth-centered inertial frame. Someone sitting on the North Pole would be in this frame. 
What this means is that for all mm. other observers on the Earth, the speed of light is actually not constant at all. This implies that the constancy of the speed of light, which is a postulate of the theory of relativity, is very possibly an illusion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, awesome video. So, oh, okay, now I get it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's up? No, I just, no. I just said, oh, now I get it. Yeah, it's just an illusion, you know. So I'd like get to get one of those. All yeah, same, same. No, you're good. Uh, I was just saying, I don't get his orientation. I don't get his choice. Like he believes he's on a ball, right? Yep. So what? Why did he set up his his axes like that? And if he did, right? And he was supposedly expecting some type of rotation. I wonder how that would affect trying to measure the ether drift. If the if the rotation that is being measured is the ether drift then would it affect the laser interferometer or whatever by having it at a 45 degree angle rather than perpendicular to the ground? It takes readings either way to get the strongest reading. You have to have it axially aligned with the sky or on the globe. They say you axially align it with the axis of rotation and they do that by aligning it with Polaris. So in the Northern hemisphere, on a globe or a plane to get the, if it's a vortex emanating from the North pole, you would do the same, uh, Z axis correction to, to get the maximum fringe reading. Only to the North. It's where the source is. Right. That's so wild. Even I don't get that. So why, why did he expect a null? And then neg- because C when should he, be constant. When he wasn't, no, when he wasn't, when he's doing when he was doing east uh east west south readings. the south axis whatever wait the south was no it was like de- almost no yeah that's what you were saying i thought he i thought he inverted it and got 7.5 as well yeah and he, i saw a fringe yeah yeah and then he adds them yeah. and then he adds them together and then it's 15 degrees per hour if i'm not mistaken I don't know. I have to come oh, back to oh, it. I know, what you're, I know what you're saying. I know what you're saying now. I get it. Got it figured out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. All right, cool. So, yeah, so that's the that's what they say. That's how they say it works. This is their go-to proof. This is a go-to proof for single-axis gyro readings. Now, uh, for single-axis gyro readings, real quick, let me just touch on that. Real quick, let me make sure I'm sharing the right screen. So, for single-axis gyro readings, there's uh, two observation stations in the north. One is in Pisa, Italy, and the other one is in Germany. So they're, and they're both around the 45th latitude, and they both note that their correction angles are 45 degrees-ish. So there's no distinction here um, on a globe or a plane or anything or whatever. Oh, shoot. Closed out the wrong one. Second. All right. Now, when we get into those single-axis readings, again... If you, um, assuming that the ether flow follows toroidal geometry, well, you would, in this, so the source of the motion is from the sky, you would actually make the same correction angles on a plane. Um, as you get further away from the center axis of rotation, you would have to tilt your, you would have to tilt the device's Z axis to maintain alignment to get the best readings. So that's what, that's what that would look at, look like. This was modeled out by I Can Science that, um, made a nice, uh, model for us. Um, he's not a glober. I mean, he's not a flat earther or anything like that. So this is just something cool we made for us. Um, and then to kind of depict what that looks like here. So when they say, oh, we took this reading and it's the cosine to the latitude. Therefore, it has to be earth rotation, et cetera, et cetera. Same exact concept. The sky is moving 15 degrees per hour. Ether flow is doing the same. Um, it's going to, as you get further away from that vortex, you're going to you're going to have different fluctuations within that. So this is kind of what it would look like. With a vortex emanating from the uh, from the center. Oh God, dang it! One second. All right, so there would be the inner donut and the outer donut. You would have your um, convergence and divergence of the field um, at the um, at the equator. You would have the, you would have a flip zone, um, which we'll get into in a little bit but this is just like a rough outline of what it would look like. So again, emanating vortex from the North pole, 
sun's doing its analemma, you know, doing its thing as it's going around. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Okay, so wouldn't that imply wouldn't that imply that the reason you can't see like half the stars during half the year is because they're inside the ground underneath us on the projection? Wouldn't that imply that half of the stars are in the ground on the projection? What? Yeah, on the outwards, the outward do this? donut. The, on the this? outer donut, as it's, as it's yeah, as it's counter rotating, the outer no. donut as it's counter rotating, it's still a full circle projection, right? So it's projecting the band over a full circle, which is the full field of stars. Half of it's on the outside, and you can see it. They say the other half is due to like your motion further north or south, but like the projection is like inverted on the plane. So like they would actually be in the ground. That's why you can't see them. And as you travel north or south, like the whole circle like t inverts and turns. No, I have no idea what now. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. So why toroidal geometry? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, why have a uniformly rotating platform? Why a, why they have to deny a uniformly rotating platform with the Sagnac effect, right? Because it actually is going to turn out that this is detrimental to everything, right? So uh, let's see. So this is from this is from Hasselblatch, uh, 1993. They do a summary of different uh, quote unquote solutions. Um, for the Sagnac effect, they cite 23 different uh, solutions and one general relativity solution provided by Paul Levu. Now, it should be noted that all these solutions are basically just different ways to um, geometrically look at the speed of light. You know, basically, it's a way for them to acknowledge the speed of light is varying while uh, while trying to maintain their belief system. Um, and it's usually what they'll do is they'll invoke a transformation, watch the event from a geometrically convenient position, and then deny that the uniformly rotating platform is an inertial frame. Because then the reason they have to do that is because they have to take it to this general relativity explanation that was provided by Paul Levu, because all 22 of these are all insufficient to explain um, the actual friend shift pattern. And because they all invoke, they all do things like invoking absolute space um, to preserve the distance, or they invoke a. Uh, an imaginary velocity vector for electromagnetic propagation to preserve the time, right? To make everything uh, appear proportional. And then if you, but if you do that, then you can't explain a, f a physical fringe difference, right? So none of these um, actually explain anything. And it's just kind of a bunch of attempts to, uh, you know, flailing in the wind or whatever, as they say. So shout out to Hassel, Hasselblatch for making these all uh, convenient in one location. So a lot of these involve things like, okay, so we're in the lab frame. We do our experiment. But, um, you know, the speed of light changes. So how do we get around that? Well, if we transform to the North Pole and we watch the lab frame, we would see that the speed of light is the same. Like they literally do stuff like that to try and um, invoke that the speed of light is the same. But you just have to transform, you know, that kind of stuff. So when they will get into the relativistic, I'm sorry, the general relativity um, explanation that they that they give. And, then, and this is ultimately the reason why they have to deny that a uniformly rotating platform is an inertial frame. Because the explanation, because general relativity is the only one that will allow them to uh, even attempt to provide a mechanism to explain the physical fringe. So let's see, deny the validity of the frame of the closed uniformly polygonal. So I kind of went over that. All right, so now we're going to get into the mainstream explanations that they give, and um, which we kind of already did, and then we'll touch on Paul Levu, who who came to the rescue. So this is from Tartiglia. This is a paper to. Um, this is like the best. Um, kind of, uh, what would you call it, like the best steel man of their, of the mainstream position with regarding the Sagnac effect and relativity. So he says here at the beginning of his paper, paper, paper he prefaces, the Sagnac effect is easily may, uh, may easily be described in classical terms if one assumes that the speed of light is C with respect to a static ether, considering a, uniform, a rotating platform mentioned in the introduction, you will see that it will take longer for the light to reach the emission point of the rim, uh, rim just before the platform. Meanwhile, because the receiver has moved by a forward distance, blah, blah, blah. The time of flight is uh, C plus V, right? So with, with invoking a little absolute space and all that, you can get your C plus V. You can get your proportional velocity relationship um, ratio. You can explain the friend shift patterns. Everything is all good, right? But in relativity, um, C has to be the same. It can't change. So to, to explain how a uniformly rotating platform that isn't moving at relativistic speeds Right, it's moving at um, you know slower, way slower speeds than uh, relativistic. Right, so how are they going to get um, length contraction and time dilation out of this? Well, 
they can't. So they turn to your boy Tartiglia to invoke a um, geometrically convenient frame where they invoke absolute space as before, and then they transform. They use this transformation. They use a Lorentz transformation to um, basically watch the event unfold um, from a inertial frame, and they deny that the uniformly rotating platform is an inertial frame. So from and that and like and I, you're probably wondering, well, Alan, that doesn't explain anything. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> you know, as noted by Tartiglia himself, he says um, at some point in there, or was it, um, you know, that this was like a thought experiment that they were doing to show this. This isn't even anything that they can quantify. This is just their explanation, and then obviously it's subpar, right? So they uh, there's another well, back to also real quick too. That's right back to they're violating page one of the 1905 Einstein paper. Like that's explicitly what they're doing right there is assigning the velocity vector. But yeah, sorry, continue. No, that's that's super important. Thank you for pointing that out because like if anytime you forget that, like that's how they get you. Once because once if because the, they use that to weasel in the Lorentz transformation, but it's all predicated on preserving that space to assume, or it's all predicated on assuming absolute space and time to preserve the distances traveled or propagated through, so that they could um, maintain c on the other end of the transformation. So Einstein's whole thing is, oh, we don't need it, but it's all, it's literally based off of it. <laughs> like, yeah, so it turns out when C is not constant and you're like, oh, well, we need to actually like have some kind of, exp at least some kind of math so we can explain <laughs> this. It's like you, you can't even make a, an equation to like post, post diction, like or ad hoc explain it after the fact. You have to invoke an absolute time, an absolute time and an absolute space in order to even do the equations like it's it's just you can't do it any other way so the the whole thing is that incoherent from the get go dude it's 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 that bad um and then so another explanation was given more recently than the tartiglia one cuz this is an older one tartiglia so this guy took a crack at it forget his name it was um one second it was barada in, yeah, I'm not going to attempt to pronounce that, but shout out to those guys. They gave it. They, they gave their solid attempt. But anyway, yeah. they um they they do the same thing, and they just they say, well, you know, this is a thought experiment, and explaining the fringes is 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 really hard without um uh, without any sort of transformation, right? So that's that that's the take on it. They have no relative. They have special relativity has no answer for this. They have no way to explain the physical fringe pattern. On the other end of that measurement, man, they got like even at the highest levels of academia to this day that they've published, it says they got nothing. So we'll continue on here. So this is Paul Levu. So Sagnac was in 1913, and then until 1917, it took a couple of relativists to come up with a derivation to answer the fringe. But again, it was you know, like it's just it's not an actual answer. So Paul Levu had to step in. And invoke general relativity and say, well, lads, because it's rotating uh, uniformly, we'll just go ahead and treat that as an acceleration. And because it's an acceleration, we can now use the equivalence principle to say that this acceleration is equivalent to generating a gravitational field that will give us little pocket, little temporal pockets of time dilation and length contraction. And using conservation laws, or I'm sorry, using the conservation metrics through the um, through general relativity. They were able to conserve momentum on the small scale of a of a uh, you know a local rotating interferometer, like at non-relativistic speeds. They were able to turn that into a gravitational field to produce length contraction and time dilation to actually explain the fringe. So now they have a mechanism, right? Well, I mean, like obviously they don't have a mechanism, but they have a pretend mechanism of length contraction and time dilation um, to actually explain the fringes, right? <laughs> so now we'll. Uh, now we'll continue on a little bit and we'll come back to old Levu here in a minute. So we have Mickelson, Gale, Pearson. Oh no, it covered up my other slide. One second. All right, we have Mickelson, Gale, Pearson here. Uh, let's see, move to front. Okay. So what they did here in Mickelson, Gale, Pearson, they had pipes that were about a kilometer long, um, making a rectangle. So if you kind of look at the globe, right, it would look like that. We're on a plane, it would be, you know, just flat. And then, so the aim here was to show that the speed, or to um, 
they measured the the quote unquote rotation of the Earth, right, to show that the speed of light is um, the end result of this experiment shows that the speed of light is different traveling west to east than it is um, east to, east to west, and there's no variance in the north south propagation here. All right, so to get into to get into the paper here, what they say. Is this is from the abstract here. This is Mickelson, Gale, Pearson, 1925. This is the theory of the effect of the rotation of the Earth of the velocity of, the, of light is derived by, by the hypothesis of a fixed ether. So they got their variables here. So they got their north-south pipes, uh, the ones facing north-south, and then they got their uh, east-west pipes, and the variance is shown in the east-west pipes. And so and another, another thing that they say here in their paper is that they calculated the displacement on the assumption of a stationary ether as well in accordance with relativity theory. So remember the invoking absolute space to preserve the distance of rotation. So what they're doing here is they're saying that, well, when this, so let's start with this bottom corner here. Let's say that the signal is sent from right here. It goes here, hits this, right? This is our travel up or our length of travel, right? So it's going to start here and it, it's not going to hit here because the earth's rotating. So it has to move an extra distance. So now we're assigning additional velocity vectors for electromagnetic propagation and uh, invoking absolute space to preserve the total distance traveled so that we could have this rotation, right? Now, if that's also happening, similar to um, you know Coriolis and all that, distance traveled not being the same displacement, well, this is traveling um, north to south as the Earth is rotating. So this can't be in the same spot either, right? This has to also change. But it doesn't. These there's no variance north south. Even in GPS, when they've done signals where they relay um, to stations that are at the quote unquote north pole, um, there's no um, there's no sagnet corrections needed for for that propagation when it's north south. So the idea that this is due to Earth rotation is it, is gone right there essentially. And also the explanation provided, like just saying this in the paper, oh, it's in accordance with relativity, and they don't show any relativistic derivations at all. They just um, they just go with uh, the ether, which invokes absolute space and time to, to explain it. Uh, let's see. So now we move on to 1942 with DeFore and Pruner, who redid the classic Sagnac experiments uh, with the classic configuration where all the where the light source and the photographic recorder are on the rotating device. Now, um, to make something clear real quick, what determines the state um, of an inertial or like, like is a frame inertial or not um, is determined by where the observer is. So, if the observer is on the rotating platform, um, and that's where the that's where the measurements being taken, that's where the photographic plate is. That's the observer. So you would consider that um, you would consider that frame being taken in an inertial frame. Right, if you were going to follow Einstein's uh, d doctrine about uh, a uniformly rotating uh, device or whatever, right? So, so they did the original Sagnet configuration just to see if that held true, and it and it did. They got a fringe pattern that corresponded to the um, rotation of the device and the length, or the total length of uh, uh, the total path of light, the total length that light had to travel, right? So they they did another configuration. Um, to test to test another variable, this one was where the the light source was off of the um, the platform, and then the recorder was still on. Using collimators, they reflected the beam and made it all nice and crisp, so they could get their measurements. And um, the the measurement there was in accordance with relativity theory, um, where it's where the speed of light is independent of the light source, right? So everything was good there. And then they did a third configuration where the light source and the recorder are fixed to the lab wall and there's also a recorder fixed to the rotating device and there'll be a there'll be a, um, a beam splitter that'll hit that photographic recorder and one that goes back to the uh, photographic recorder on the wall so in this configuration oh, oh wait so so obviously the one on the wall had a totally different reading right because it's not in the same inertial frame and we all know that it's based on the being in the same inertial frame in that loop right no turns out they had the same reading Alan, you're making things <laughs> up. Dude. What kind of pseudoscience paper is this? Come on. They didn't actually do this. Dude, they not only did they did it, um, they had Paul LeVoux step in to try and explain it. So he gave the relativistic 
derivation for an observer. Not, so let me um, let me back up a second for how for the mechanism for how Lavu explains this, or for how they all explain it, really. So the baseline thing you do when you're analyzing this, it doesn't matter where the photographic recorder is. You trans you during the transformation, the process is to um, center yourself with the axis of rotation so you could be symmetrical and observe it from from that location outwards. So you have to choose this this frame at the center here where you can and this frame can be considered stationary, right? Even though it's rotating, it's at the center, it could be stationary or rotating. So they take that frame, they take this preferred frame, and then they could make their relativistic derivations for things, right? And again, not, not even explaining the physical of the fringe, but just to even pretend they have to use a preferred frame at the center of the device, right? So in Paul Levu's metric in general relativity, they do the same thing with their um, with their transformation. They're at the center of the device, and then they invoke their link contraction and time dilation um, relative to that preferred um, or relative to that frame in the center, which they say that they which they say that they're just choosing for mathematical convenience. It just makes the math a little shorter. No, I, I think I think <laughs> you're wrong. I think it's just covariant. They don't have to do any of that. Yeah. Uh, I wish, or they wish, I guess. <laughs> Sorry, uh, to you're good. You're good. Um, so yeah, so Paul now, he's like, no worries, boys. I got you. We'll, uh, we'll figure out everything based off of where the, um, the observers located on the wall and that total distance traveled and all that. Um, and it turned out, it turns out that relativity could not make the prediction. So the classic theory predicted the amount of fringes that was measured and the, uh, Relativity was off by an order of magnet, uh, off by a hundred, I think it was. Was it off by? It says it here somewhere. That's a factor of ten. You can see it in the figure, dude. Oh, right here, factor of ten. Thank you, sir. So it was off by a factor of ten. Couldn't, um, couldn't answer the fringe shift pattern from its location. And then Paul's like, "Well, you know, because it's a uniformly rotating device, you have to assume gravitational effects are involved, and we have to use the center of the frame." It, um, and use and use relativity how it's intended to be or whatever, right? So, so that was his hand wave dismissal of the situation. Even though there's not supposed to be a preferred frame, right? All all inertial frames are created equally or whatever, right? So then we move on to 2004 with Ru Yang Wang, who did a landmark experiment in interferometry with a um, what was it? A fiber optic gyro. Uh, in this in this particular configuration he did here, where these two bits here that wiggle, they cancel each other out. This remains stationary, and this back and forth linear motion is measured. Now we'll get into um, we've heard lots of explanations to this that it's rel it's measuring relative motion to 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 the to the detector that it's me measuring relative motion to the other parts of the closed loop that uh, to like the total coil. You know, X, Y, Z, we've even heard invoking absolute space and time to preserve the total distance traveled in assigned velocity vectors for the propagation and all that. So um, there's no there's no answer to that. And this should not be detected. So this is a linear motion detection. So the Sanyak um, detection, the special relativity, they say, you know, oh, it's a it's a rotating platform. You know, can't can't detect it. It's acceleration, blah, blah, blah. They hand wave dismiss it from relativity and they and they pass it off to the homie general relativity to explain it. So in this situation here where they're detecting linear motion in this configuration, this is actually a direct violation of special relativity. And the only explanation for that is to um, defer back to Tartiglia and um, what was that other guy's name? Barda, B Bahadra. Badra. B Badra. Yeah, you have to defer back to those guys and do Lorentz, uh, do Lorentz pretends and just transform. So... Let's say, let's say maybe, maybe this, maybe there is some loop configuration and this just, it, maybe it is a loop and it just can't be measured and it, it is, you know, what, whatever, right? So let's move on to a phase conjugate mirror and see what happens there. So in a phase conjugate or in a conventional mirror, when they're sending these uh, wavelengths down these paths, right, to complete these circuits, the, uh, and it bounces back to complete its loop, it reorientates the wavefront. Well, now in a phase conjugate mirror, it basically um, keeps the, it preserves the orientation of the wavefront and sends it back. So it kind of looks like it's traveling backwards in time. You could see the wavefront. So with this configuration here, using interferometers where you split the beam, you cancel out the one beam because you don't, or you, you don't care about that reading. You just take a one rate, you just take a one way reading on one of the arms of the interferometer using a phase conjugate mirror. And what they found uh, in a rotating one is that the 
the speed of light is already changed in the one-way direction. So a lot of, uh, there's some speculation on the speed of light. Like, is it, is it the same two ways? Is it one way, blah, 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 right? Like when, when does it change for the, um, uh, for the, like for a friend shift pattern to, to register? Does it, you know, is it when it hits the mirror? Is it, is it on the way? Who knows, right? Well, it turns out using a phase conjugate mirror, they found that it happens in route one way. So, I mean, don't they like literally kind of imply that the light knew you were going to look at it or something like that's literally where they go with this, right? No, no, this is, this isn't in relation to, um, to well, I guess this is, yeah, you're right. This is not the same duality. You're right. This is just, yeah. Wow. Yeah. This so is maybe, just another big old hole. Yep. And then we move on to Bilger in 1993 with the, uh, ring laser precision measurement of non-reciprocal phenomenon. So if we recall back to the configuration of the Mickelson Gale, this is the same situation, except this one was done in, I think, Christchurch or Australia. And then there's a new one that's in, um, uh, what is it, uh, New Zealand as well. But this is 1993. They made a more precise, uh, more sensitive uh, Mickelson Gale apparatus. And using this configuration, they received quote unquote fringe patterns that correspond to earth earth's rotation in the south and um there's not a lot available on this um for the data to analyze or whatever but apparently um ag kelly did some analysis on this and has stated several times that through his analysis of it he determined that the speed of light um that that that, that the preferred direction that was shown in mickelson gale pearson where the where it's faster east to west actually flips in the south and it's faster going south to east which is you know, a complete falsification of relativity theory on itself. It falsifies um, the reading being due to um, Earth rotation because there can't be there can't be a flip in the preferred direction of uh, of electromagnetic propagation due to Earth rotation. The Earth rotates in one direction. It would have to follow suit in all um, all latitudes. There, it's not like a Coriolis thing where it's like, oh, well, now it drifts, you know, differently or whatever. That's not that's not how that works. Um, it wouldn't it wouldn't work that way. So the explanation that they give is basically um, not really talking about this. Like I've, I've, I don't really ever see anyone bring this up or or mention it. Like the only one that they talk about is the one in the in the north because they don't have to address um, anything weird because they and they don't even get into the analysis of the var of like the of the variance right of like which pipes which directions produce the fringe going faster or slower right. They just get into um, oh there's a fringe corresponds to earth rotation right. Well, you got to hand it to them. That's yeah. a that's a wonderfully obfuscational kind of term, non-reciprocal phenomena. I mean, anybody <laughs> anybody who's actually researching the topic is going to look for things like asymmetrical interferometric data on the opposite hemisphere. All of that, none of that's in this fucking title. I mean, Dude, bravo, guys. Yep. It's, yeah, it's it's so funny. It's so funny you mentioned that because that's exactly the kind of verbiage I was searching for. <laughs> And there's just and, and nothing, dude. Well, nothing. My, the words I used, I called this paper obtuse. Like, it just seems to be purposefully abstract about a lot of the ways it phrases things. Yeah. And, and then... One sorry. other quick thing, Alan. You, you mentioned New Zealand, like, as if there's another interferometer in New Zealand. But, like, let's clarify, there is no interferometer they're taking readings from in New Zealand. No, there is. New Zealand... What's that? No, there is. They they take their oh. re they take their readings and then they compare them to Germany and then they throw out whatever's wrong and then they go, "Look, we match Germany." Oh, I thought okay, I thought they were like basically taking Germany's data. Okay. No, 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 it's a it's a collaboration and by collaboration they're per, they're forcing symmetry relative to the latitude. Okay, okay we're going to have to I'm going to have to look into that more later. That's Yeah. Interesting. I'm, uh... I'm going to offer testimony as a local. I will say now, anybody present at either Christchurch or Dunedin at a POSAC Institute are far too busy burning pouches in the street drunk as fuck <laughs> instead of doing a, an experiment such as how you paint here. Hell yeah. Did they're not, so what you're telling me is they're not looking for the non-reciprocal phenomenon out there? They're not looking for anything. <sighs> they next brew. Okay, they're looking for things that are flammable. Nice. Um, another interesting thing to note about about this experiment. So how Doug was saying in the 
in the north for the single axis gyro, you have to have it orientated a specific orientation to get those readings. So in the north here, we got that 45 degree. So we should, and then um, I'm not going to pull it back up, but going back to those two observations observ or laboratories in uh, Italy and Germany, those have their 45 degrees. So what are the odds that there's a 45 degree correction in the south um, or, or, or some degree of correction, right? Just any, right? Um, turns out they mentioned that they keep it perfectly level. So in, <laughs> the interpretation of, of that on their end for the globe would be um, parallel to the local horizontal. But it's like, you know, obviously that's they're lit it's literally just level. Um, and they and they somehow got a reading that matches the 15 degrees per hour or whatever out of that. So just an interesting tidbit to note there on the alleged, um, you know, needing it to be in a certain orientation. To, to be proof of the globe. Um, okay, so now we're going to get into some relativistic um, kind of counter arguments to the Sagnac effect, to these measurements, right? To, to the variance and the speed of light. So as we kind of went over earlier, the distance change in a platform, I'm sorry, the time on the rotating platform is different than the, um, than the lab, right? So these are Kelly's responses to those in, in a paper that he wrote, kind of did like a back and forth Q and I thought these would be useful. So another, so another defense of the relativity theory is that the light path upon the disk is no, is longer in one direction than the other, but the circumference upon the disk as measured by someone upon it is surely the same in both directions. So they're always trying to like change the radius of it or change the length, the area, all this stuff, the length contraction, blah, blah, blah. Oh, it traveled, you know, distance is different through absolute space, et cetera. But this equation here doesn't mention anything about a changing of area, right? It's a fixed area, the total path traveled. This Angular rotation here is just how fast it's spinning. Four is just the distribution of that, um, of the of the rotation rate and the area traveled over C squared. So there's no, there's no like, hey, the special, then, then like there's no, there's no variable here to say, oh, but the time in the lab frame will be different from blah, blah, blah. Like, no, this is just straight up a proportional velocity relationship derived from the angular rotation of a device in the enclosed uh, light path or total path of travel. Okay, but does anybody ever take the time to plug the numbers into reality into these formulae that they loft out like fodder? Anybody actually take a look? It's always this C squared thing that is I find so numerically and arithmetically damning to anything that they're saying. Um, and I'm going to digress on this, or actually, I guess I'm going to circle back um, on what you were talking about before in regard to falsifiability. But by all means, on continue right where you're at. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so in regards to may, may, maybe the time is different on the on the platform, right? So the formula can be derived by assuming that light travels by relation to the fixed laboratory, but the measurement of the time difference is due solely aboard the disk. What can this mean? The only explanation possible is that the time aboard the spinning disk is, is, and the fixed laboratory is the very same. This is not in accordance with special relativity theory. So if these two, like this is why it's so detrimental to them to like avoid this as a special relativistic effect and pass it off to general relativity because they can't even touch this without denying that it's that the frame is inertial and it's in special relativity applies. So I was going to read some more refutations from, um, from Bennett's paper and then close out on that. Do you guys, um, so Stone, if you want to touch back on the C squared thing real quick. And then we'll we'll just read off some some Bennett. Sure, I just, it had to do with the time dial dilation calculation from way back. That one half, I even wrote it down over here. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I got you. I can pull that back up. Um, for the closed loop circuit, uh, the uh, way back here, all, all the way at the beginning, actually. Uh, right here. You're doing great. You're doing great so far, bro. Thank you, sir. One half times v squared over c squared. Stone. Uh, I'm not sure if he. Do, do you yeah, see maybe you should be able to hear me. Oh, there you go. Um, yeah, I was just taking the bind off because I'm over to a spreadsheet and punching Q is really messing things up. <laughs> oh, you're, oh, you're good. Okay, so uh, here we are. Um, 
like when you look at that figure, the the one half t squared over c squared, just plug things in. You're going to take your one clock, and let's say you're going to go for a thousand seconds in one direction. Okay, that's like 16 minutes. And let's say you're going to go a thousand meters per second while you're doing that. That's like Mach 1.5. You know, so you're you're moving and you go in a net of a million meters there over a thousand seconds, right? Well, what's what's the figure going to end up to be? What's what's t over there? What is delta t? It's 5.56 times 10 to the negative 12 seconds. Okay, we're talking billionths of a second difference. Taking this thing at Mach 0.5, Mach 1.5 for 16 minutes in some other direction, and the time between them is something you can't fucking measure. Bro, that's... <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm so glad you brought that up, man, because they will try and invoke time dilation for, like, like the pound repka experiment, for example, and I actually found a guy who did the math on it, like how you just pointed out, and trying to give them like the absolute most benefit of the doubt um, to basically like, you know, make the math easier and just give it, um, you know, a, a nice clean reading or whatever. He ends up calculating that the time dilation, that if there was a time dilation effect um, in that experiment, it would be like 10 to the minus 21 and the experiments like threshold measurement range or whatever, like it can only measure 10 to the minus 15. So it, like the explanation given wouldn't even be perceivable. But people will just say it. Even, even 10 to the minus 15 is not measurable with our current technology to any degree of certainty. They love that fucking word. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's ridiculous to consider those orders of magnitude at the same time. You're, you're countering against their assertion that light's moving at 300 million meters per second. And all of these things are in meters and seconds. You know what I mean? And you're squaring that. <laughs> And the denominator. They get real, guys. Come on. That's 300 million times 300 million and as a divisor. What, what are you saying about anything using figures that, that astronomically large and small? You know what I mean? Anyways, that's that's my rant about that. Yeah. It's just, it's it's where they get these like really tiny calculations. And then, the, and then when they actually account for something, you know, they're like, oh, look, relativity is true. <laughs> it's just that none of it is falsifiable. It's, it's, it's all unicorn fault. Exactly. It's it's unicorn fart fantasy land. You know what I mean? Pardon my food. Yeah. yeah well, by the stats he gave first, it's more probable it's error. <laughs> yeah. And then, all right, so we'll close out on reading some arguments on that Bennett provided that relativists will use to uh, combat the Wang experiment. And it was actually... Like while reading through some of this one night, um, we actually went through like a whole gambit of these arguments with a relativist. So it was kind of refreshing to see, um, you know, how, how they're misusing their own belief system to reify, um, to perpetually reify it and never have it falsified. So contrarian opinions to the Wang fiber optic cable test. Claim one, what explains the Wanging result is that light moves along a closed circuit and the observer is in motion with respect to that circuit. Reply. This is what the Wang test shows. One, an object moving in the lab frame drags along the ether at the same speed. Two, only the lab frame can be used to apply the laws of dynamics. Claim two. The equation, delta T equals 2VL over C squared, is the base of the constancy of the speed of light. Reply, the measured speed <laughs> the measured speed of light was C plus or minus V, not C. So yeah, we actually had this one. Um, and it's like the only velocity component in there is the rotation, or in this case, the linear motion of the cable and the speed of light. So it's like, where's the where's the plus where's the velocity relationship coming from? <laughs> right? Um, you know, it can only come from one space one one space. All right, so claim three, the Wang experiment shows the results agree exactly with the predictions of special relativity. Three, or reply, the principle, the constantly of the speed of light everywhere is the speed of light equals C. This is refuted by the result of the speed of light on the conveyor being C plus or minus V, where the speed V of the conveyor and the ether are entrained. So 
like I was saying earlier, all motion will have its own either optical vortex, as uh, Sagnet called it. Um, so that's, that's what he's saying here. So the motion of the conveyor is also entraining an ether vortex with it. Claim four. The reflected light will be red shifted from one mirror and blue shifted to the other, depending on the state of motion of the source of receiver relative to the optic uh, fiber optic uh, to the optic fiber. Reply, there is no relative motion between the emitter and the receiver and the fiber optic cable can measure the conveyor uh, receiver and the fiber in the cable, fiber cable in the measured conveyor frame. Everything is at rest in that frame. That's relative motion. See, that's what they were, to, mm, yeah. I've heard that too. So like, they'll say that, um, yeah, there's no relative motion there between the, there is no relative motion between the emitter receiver and the fiber cable. In the measured conveyor frame, so the measured conveyor, yeah. The, the, there's Dude. no relative motion; it just gets longer. Like that's literally what Dude. they say. Like, oh my god, <laughs> man, <laughs> it makes no sense. Dude. Claim five: the optical paths, the optical path links are different in the conveyor. <laughs> this is my favorite. The optical path links are different in the conveyor. Are on the conveyor and in the lab frame. Reply, the speed of light is in both frames is equal to the phase shifts in time are equal to both optical paths traveled. So it's they're the same in both frames, right? So kind of like how Kelly was pointing out, well, the time matches in the lab frame and it matches in the um, uh, on the conveyor or, you know, on the rotating platform. What does that mean? What, what, what do we make of this, guys? Um, claim six, Dr. Wang linearly moved a straight section of the fiber while the rest of the device was held stationary. Reply: The source of the detector of the fiber optic cable was moved all together. Sorry, was moved all together in the lab frame. The signet detector, the fiber optic gyro reads uh, C. When, sorry, uh, when translating and non-rotating in the lab frame. When the interferometer is in linear motion in the lab frame, but only the linear segment produces a phase shift, because the linear motion is through the ether. <laughs> Claim seven. It has not been demonstrated that the linear motion of the entire device can register a signal. Reply. In fact, the graphical results <laughs> is exact. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I'm looking at that. Dude, that graph though. Let's let me look at that real quick. I just want to see that linear fucking graph real quick. What is the claim? Seven is literally not. Uh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Isn't that great? Oh, where is it? I need to see the graph. Can you go back to seven for just a second before you? Nah, okay. graph's already up. Is. Go ahead. It's just your boy linear graph, you know, measuring that linear motion. I don't know. <laughs> That's funny. It's just nah. <laughs> All right, what was your? It's not Ben's demon, like. Yeah. Yeah. That's okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Did you have uh, something you wanted to ask, Pizza? No, that's good, bro. Okay. So, claim eight. The phase occurs due to time and the velocity changes. Reply. The, re the shift is constant at a constant speed, and the graph shows that the, that's versus the, uh, shows the graph versus the speed, or the shift versus the speed. The cause of the shift is the velocity and not a velocity change equals acceleration. GG. Damn. How do I make that more red? <laughs> Yeah, I remember you, were, you already highlighted it a bunch the first night that we read this paper. All right. Yeah, it's getting pretty bright, ain't it? <laughs> Dude, God dang. Like... This is about the point in the write-up where if Witsit was writing the replies, he'd be writing stuff like, oh, no, man, now you're just panicking. <laughs> dude now you're just panicking dude <laughs> claim nine we have proved that the wang effect originates from two or from the closure of two man let me start that over claim nine we have proved that the wang effect originates from the closure of the two spaces space paths as seen in the co in the frame co-moving with the emitter slash receiver and from the relative motion between the emitter slash receiver and the optic fiber or physical device reply in the co-moving frame everything is at rest except the light beam and the surrounding laboratory the beam path is always uh, are always closed there is no relative motion between the emitter slash receiver and the optical fiber cable everything else is at rest why is this so difficult why is this concept so difficult why do you think it's so difficult tope i don't know man maybe because uh 
<laughs> we live in a religious, dogmatic world. Is it, uh, is there it's, it's, it's quite amazing that we literally, like, we ran the gauntlet within, like, two days. We literally hit all nine of those <laughs> things. When is we read that the... paper after having those debates, we were just... We were just like laughing the whole time because it was insane that like we had we like we were we said that night we're like man we should have read this sooner because it was literally every single possible rebuttal that we had run into like verbatim almost. Yeah, wasn't uh, wasn't it because you know the cables a closed loop so you can't say anything from outside the cables interfering with it yet you have this like superfluous thing that's dragging through it and causing a shift in the light inside the cable that's going to close loop. Exactly. Yeah. Drag ether is what mm -hmm. uh, the way Bennett puts it. Flowing through the cable, like, you know, like not through it, like one point to the end other, but just like overall through the matter of the cable. Yep. And this happens in the, uh, the glass core fiber and in the air core fiber. And the refractive index is essentially irrelevant to the uh, resultant fringe shift. So you can't really, you know, it's it's a, uh, it's relative to an ether, not necessarily a refractive index. So you have a micro refractive index change proportional to direction too. Would yeah, you? and you just have to be explicit about that because, um, like they 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 invoke some weird, or I think some people will invoke some some weird. Uh, refraction math to try and explain stuff like fresnel which is the exact same thing as this but just using water and then you get a ref you do get a refraction rate that goes down to 40 you, like you lose like around 70 kind of percent of the quote induction rate of light um but you still have a 44 percent proportional velocity increase and decrease going with and against the water Yeah, and losing, yeah. 44%? Yep. That's a huge difference. Huge. It directly, yeah. Yeah, that, that relationship is, is very... 44% uh, light and water, different direction, magnitude of velocity? Wow. Yeah, that, that's a... Uh... It's it's not forty four percent in the open air. <laughs> yeah, those those BBs. Yeah. I wonder what the proportionality is of a glass window. Man. <laughs> yeah, right. But single pane or double? Cool. Any other questions, comments related to uh, either presentation or anything? Shane, you got something you want to say? Great. <laughs> yeah. What the fuck is happening? My push to talk is also mic mute. So what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> But yeah, sorry for like, come, coming in and just rolling through that, dude. Pisy, I'm my bad, dude. <laughs> oh, you're good. Cool. Yeah, and uh, I guess... <laughs> it's been missing right. for a while now. The Shane I'm... summaries. Yeah, I might have been walking the dog. I might have fell a couple of times on the ice. I might have had my own adventure and not paid any attention. I'm sorry, dude. <laughs>
I just got back like fucking A, man. What the fuck happened to me? <laughs> oh. Tonight we learned that C is always constant regardless of the inertial frame and there's no proportional velocity for in shift and uh, there's no such thing as superluminal speeds from photonic crystals. Light's always the same speed. Regardless like a of their body bag. It's like a row? Four in a row? Nice. I love how you guys yeah. got challenged in 